Um, I'm going to start off by saying this is kind of motivated by Nick's talk of, I don't know how many weeks that was, where you talked about your three, you gave your three um, short little videos. Right. And this is motivated by that. And the one point that Nick made was about uh, if we have a clock at A, in frame A and it moves to frame B and then moves back to frame A, will that clock be slow? And you said yes, and that would disprove special relativity if I recall. Isn't that what we said? So I use, I use special relativity consistently for accelerations to different inertial frames and then coming back to the main frame. And it's by relativity, it should be running slow to other clocks at rest in the initial frame, but empirically that's been shown to be an incorrect conclusion. So the reason for this talk is really basically to um, sort of elaborate on uh, Nick's uh, video. And my thesis is going to be, the thesis of this talk is the reason or the problem is that the principle of relativity is incorrect. It's a false principle. And we're going to, my idea of, of presenting this is to talk about Dingle, Herbert Dingle. And is there anybody, I guess everybody's probably heard of Herbert Dingle if you're a dissident in science, but he is a famous scientist known for his, quote, uh, rejection of special relativity. And he's probably the most dogged, persistent opponent. I mean, he just, um, you know, so he's famous for being a dogged, persistent opponent of, of special relativity. So we're going to talk a little bit about Dingle and his, and his uh, thesis. Um, and then even after he died, you know, people were still criticizing him. I.J. Good criticized him. You know, which was kind of unfair because Dingle was dead and couldn't reply, but um, he had some other people who defended his position. Um, now, what Dingle was, okay, I, um, uh, oh, now the point, really, the point that I'm trying to make here is that it was really the opponents to Dingle that kind of reveal this mathematical approach, which I'm going to um, explain. And McCray is primarily responsible for this argument. And I.J. Good basically repeated it again um, uh, 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 in his arguments against Engel. Um, and the point of it is that this argument that um, McCray and Good used sort of leads us to the conclusion, which is the ironic thing that they proved that as special relativity was false while well, they were trying to prove that what Dingle said was false. Okay, that's, and this is kind of one of the ironies of debating special relativity is people who oppose critics, you know, basically kill their own argument that special relativity is correct in the process of arguing. Okay. Um, now, my point is that um, this math argument, basically what it does is it shows that um, in all the cases of relativity, if you accept the principle of relativity, the reason it's called relativity is because of the principle of relativity, which is the fundamental hypothesis. If you use that principle, um, if, you, if you go by that principle, you, you basically are in trouble. You're going to get contradictions, inconsistencies, um, and other failures of the mathematics and the theory. And essentially what relativists have done through the years is sort of try to avoid admitting that the principle of relativity is false and um, finding other ways around the criticism. Um, okay, so if we dispense with the principle of relativity, all these contradictions, inconsistencies, and all these other problems kind of just disappear and the mathematics suddenly becomes simple and easy and uh, we don't have any more confusion. Now, um, the point is that Dingle demonstrates to us that, that um, the relativity establishment and the scientists really basically don't want to agree that they made a mistake 
and that the principle of relativity is false. Okay, so that's kind of an overview of, of my thesis. Now, um, one of the first things we're gonna talk about is um, this problem of the confusion regarding the correct theory of special relativity. So um, Nick's already talked about that and made this point. He refers to what's called the just observed version. And um, some people who um, oppose Einstein's uh, uh, thesis, like for instance, Dingle will get criticized because they say he's using the wrong theory. They don't actually come out and say that, they just say he's wrong. Um, and then um, to basically illustrate that, I'm going to talk about um, Einstein's different papers and books that he published. And um, then I'm going to follow that up. This is kind of basically a roadmap to the presentation. And we'll talk about Dingle tried to show that the, the whole thing was false for some reason. There was a mistake somewhere. Okay, um, Einstein's papers on SR. Okay, we, we all pretty much know about this 1905 electrodynamics of moving bodies, which was the first paper. Now he doesn't mention relativity in this paper, which is interesting. Um, <clears throat> now this paper is responsible for kind of a lot of misconceptions, if you will, about relativity because he gives three examples of that illustrate um, time dilation. One of the examples is if we have a, um, two clocks, a clock at A and a clock at B in an inertial frame, and then we have another clock at A, and we move, and our clocks are all synchronized, and we move the clock from A to B, the clock that's moved will read will be retarded in its reason and its reading, excuse me. And that's kind of similar to what Nick was talking about that we started off with. Um, if you change the inertial frame from one inertial frame by motion to another inertial frame and then return to the original frame, that the clock will be retarded. Okay, then um, another example he gave with, is this, um, if uh, uh, we have a construct a polygon circle of um, segments of a polygon, and not the motion is not in a circle; it's in linear segments, so that you can say each segment's inertial frame. That when a clock moves around this uh, um, these segments in the polygon and return to the starting point, that it will be slow, and then. Uh, the last example is um, a clock at, at the equator and a clock at the poles. At one of the poles, the clock at the equator will read slow relative to the clock at the poles. Now, now it seems pretty clear he's saying that clocks are going to physically run slow. All right. Now, in the 1907 paper, things are a little bit different. He doesn't say that anymore. He says something different. And he basically deletes mentioning these three examples that I just uh, cited. And he talks more about um, that, the, that the clock in the opposite frame appears slow to the observer, okay, which is a different kind of take on it. Um, so is the clock, the clock isn't really running slow in the moving frame, it just appears to run slow. And in 1910, uh, he has another paper, uh, The Principle of Relativity and Its Consequences. And you notice that these uh, three papers, 1907, 1910, 1911, they talk about relativity, the principle of relativity. So he's really basically making the point that it's the principle of relativity that's the foundation of the theory. Um, here we have, um, in 1912, a paper in, Here's the book here, Manuscript on the Special Theory of Relativity, but most people probably never heard of this. Um, it was never published until recently when this book appeared. There's the book. And, um, and it kind of gives a different take from the papers that he published in 1907, 1910, and 1911. And it sounds more like 
1905 paper where he repeats his example of a clock traveling in the polygon will run slow. So now we have this issue of, um, you know, which, which, pay, which um, description that he gave is the real principle, is the real theory of relativity. It's not really clear. Um, another book, this is the um, uh, Bonanza. This is a, uh, appeared in paperback, there it is here. Uh, a lot of people have read this book. This is a very popular book. Um, and so they, their understanding of Einstein is really based on reading this book. And the 1905 paper, because that's uh, been translated into English fairly early on. So that's a very common paper, everybody knows that. All right. Um, Okay, so now I'm kind of briefly discussing here. What, what are you saying about time and how clocks work is confusing. In 1905, he says the clocks run slow and gave the three examples I just gave. In 1907, he deletes those three examples. And uh, he says that uh, clocks run slow observed from system S the moving clock runs slow. It's not exactly clear what he's saying. Yeah, you sort of have to read it a bunch of times to really figure it out. Maybe if you, you know, if you really understand what he's talking about, maybe you can figure it out. 1910, he doesn't say the same thing he said in 1907. Now, this is a key point. It would have been better if he'd have said the same thing in all of his papers and phrased it the same way. He now says a moving clock runs slow with respect to a reference system as observed from this system. What? You know, you read that and you kind of, that's kind of peculiar. And in 1911, he says, thus the moving clock runs more slowly than the same clock when in a state, when in a state of rest with respect to K. Um, yeah. So um, that's kind of, ambiguous, but he's really trying to say that the clock appears observed from the rest frame, the clock in the moving frame appears to run slow. But as I pointed out, in his 1912 paper, he goes back to what he said in 1905, which implies that the clock is physically running slow. Okay, um, now we have um, some experimental evidence that we can talk about. And we have the Hafel Keating experiment, which kind of is a proxy for the uh, moving from frame A to frame B and then back to frame A. And of course, they claim that that proves that Einstein's special theory is correct because the clock that was moved is observed to run slow or to be behind or retarded relative to the clocks that remained on the Earth in this experiment where they flew clocks around in airplanes. I hope everybody's familiar with this experiment. Then you have the muon decay uh, experiment. There's a number of experiments um, that uh, cosmic rays take longer supposedly to decay than um, similar decays in the laboratory. And so that's said to be proof of special relativity because the moving, fast moving muons are um, delayed by time dilation. Time is, is retarded for these uh, fast moving particles and so therefore um, they don't appear to decay as fast as uh, particles at rest. Then we have the GPS system. We're going to talk about this uh, more at the end where um, <clears throat> that one of the fundamental aspects of that system is that there's a um, correction factor that's put into the system that accounts for the um, rate of the clocks being slow, the satellite clocks, as they move through space. The satellite clocks are slow, and so they put in a correction factor to make them run fast to um, correct for the fact that they run slow relative to clocks on the Earth. So satellite clocks in orbit run slow relative to clocks on the Earth. So that kind of would seem to uh, be experimental ver uh, uh, validation. 
But then now we have this problem of which of these different um, theories or wh which paper do we use to, uh, that I, which pronouncement of Einstein's, which theory of Einstein's are we going to use? To, it doesn't seem, these, these experiments don't seem to validate the experiment, uh, I mean, the theory um, expressed in the 1907, 1910, and 1911 papers where the clock only runs slow when it's observed from the rest frame. So that, that, that seems to be confusing, but this is to say that this proves Einstein's theory is correct. All right, now I'm gonna talk a little bit about Dingle. Um, Dingle sort of was one of these people who got, you know, he, he, he kind of liked to stick his finger into the eye of the, uh, of the science, science establishment. And so one of his first papers where he does that is uh, this uh, paper, Modern Aristotelianism, uh, in Peers in Nature in 1937, where he says, relativity is metaphysics. <laughs> you know, I'm, I don't think they appreciated that. And then later in 1939, he published a paper called The Relativity of Time, which um, I talked about a little bit. And uh, this is a copy of this paper, which was also published in Nature. Okay. And I tried to get a copy of this paper, but it's paywalled. So nature wants you to pay a bunch of money for it. And, uh, but luckily um, I did have a copy of the first page, I apparently lost it. Anyway, he talks about the different clocks and um, he makes some statements in this paper that kind of, kind of ignited a controversy. Um, you know, one of the points he said was that, you know, if I construct uh, different clocks, uh, an hourglass clock, and he gives different examples of physical implementations of clocks. He demonstrates that they don't all comply with the relativistic time dilation uh, prediction that Einstein said. Well, that didn't set well with the, uh, um, <coughs> there were a bunch of people who wrote letters into nature saying that Dingle was wrong. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that, Dingle sort of introduced in his discussion in this paper was he raised the question of what's a what's what's a legitimate clock? You know, what does Einstein mean by clock? Well, Einstein never defines what a clock is. He just assumes that a clock exists because everybody, you know, he says so. He just, well, we have a clock, and you know, it's this metaphysical object. Um, and Dingle tries to sort of say, um, well, what is it physically? How, how can we, and that's how he gets into this, where he talks about the different physical implement, implementations of clocks. But one of Dingle, excuse me, one of Dingle's main points is he talks about the fact that a clock in order to be legitimate has to be calibrated relative to the um, standard of reference of time. So in other words, um, there's a definition of what time is, and back in Dingle's day, that would have been defined by the rotation of the Earth. A second is um, a fraction uh, defined by the rotation of the Earth in a day. And then that's been refined now to where it's a, um, a second is defined in terms of the frequency of a, of a cesium atom. Um, so Dingle is sort of asking, what is it's really going on? And he talks about, and this is kind of one of his main points, that it's this, the difference in what Einstein is talking about is a difference in the scale of time measure. So he's saying the Lorentz transform tells us that the measure, time measurement in the moving frame is not the same as the scale of time in the rest frame. Um, now, of course, this wasn't really accepted by the physics people got into a dispute with Paul Epstein. He wrote a book. I should have brought the book. I have a copy of the book. It's upstairs. Um, it's a very modest little book. And, um, you know, Epstein criticized his book in his review of it. And so that they got into a, an argument over that. Then, of course, in the 1950s, we have the uh, famous disputes over the twin paradox. Now, there's a lot of material 
um, that Dingle wrote in the 1950s and his uh, disagreements with the physics establishment. I'm not going to really try to cover all that. Um, in the 1960s, there was this, another famous exchange in uh, Nature and um, where he got into uh, debates with uh, McCray. And, um, and I forget exactly when that was, 1964, 66, somewhere in there. Anyway, these are, this is in Nature. Now, the debate with McCray is kind of the point that I want to try to get at. And that um, if <coughs> Dingle's point was that um, you can't tell, the principle of relativity says you can't decide uh, which clock is moving and which clock is at rest. And that's kind of the starting point. And Dingle says, well, and um, he takes the position, and this is kind of an important point to understand. He takes the position that most physicists believe that SR, special relativity, predicts that clocks will, moving clocks run slow. Okay, that's the belief that he um, essentially uh, is criticizing. He's criticizing the belief that um, moving clocks run slow. And uh, he, does, he, he thinks this idea is completely incompatible with the principle of relativity. Okay, he, he said this can't be, all right? And um, finally in his book, Science at the Crossroads, he sort of sums up some of his criticisms and the points that he's making. So to sum up what Dingle said was something like this. If you have two exactly similar clocks, A and B, and one is moving with respect to the other, they must work at different rates, i.e. one works more slowly than the other. But the theory requires that you cannot distinguish which clock is the moving one. Important point here. It is equally true to say that A rests and B moves and that B rests and A moves. The question therefore arises, how does one determine consistently with the theory which clocks works the more slowly? And he keeps asking this question and they don't answer this question. Now, we know the answer, both clocks have to run at the same rate. Now, how do we know this answer? Okay, how, how do we know this answer? Well, the answer kind of is, McRae said in his rebuttal to Dingle that Dingle was wrong. The two clocks can't run slower than each other because they can, they must run at the same rate. So Dingle was wrong in what Dingle said. But excuse me, if that's the case, then doesn't that negate all of the experiments that prove relativity? Because the proof of relativity is supposed to be that a moving clock runs slow, and I just pointed to those experiments. Okay. Now, uh, McRae's argument is that we have these two equations. We have T prime equals beta T, and this is after we do the evaluation. And the times T prime and T are durations measured on the clocks. One of the clock in the, is in the moving frame and the other clock's in the rest frame. And we have frames S and S prime. So, okay, they're in relative motion. And then you have the inverse Lorentz transform, which is T equals beta T prime, where beta is Lorentz factor. Now, what McRae said was, their only solution to this equation is when the clocks are not moving. And so Dingle couldn't possibly be right in what he said about moving clocks. But, excuse me, this kind of kills the theory of relativity, okay? Because it says, if you believe in the principle of relativity, that the clocks have to run at the same rate. The moving clock, both clocks in the frames A and S and S prime, they can't, they can't be running at different rates. That's not allowed by the principle of relativity, okay? And then we have the other problem is, okay, if we go with the 1907, 1910, 1911 theory, 
we have the same problem that the times of the clocks have to run at the same rate. Okay, now here's the point. The point is that even for the 1905 version, uh, which kind of implies that moving clocks physically run slow, and for the version where the clocks only appear to run slow, it's required that the clocks all have to run at the same rate. So the principle of relativity requires that the clocks in motion relative to a clock at rest has to run at the same rate. So all clocks have to run at the same rate according to the principle of relativity. But we know they don't. So that tells us that um, something's wrong with the principle of relativity and it's probably not correct. Okay, so to summarize, the principle of relativity requires all clocks in inertial frames to run at the same rate, always. So how is it possible that a theory that is based on the principle of relativity can predict that clocks run at different rates? So that's basically the, um, the conclusion must be then that the principle of relativity cannot be true. It's not confirmed by experiment, okay, because experiment shows the clocks run at different rates. So there's a big experimental disconfirmation of relativity. Uh, why are you mentioning GPS and that clock correction? which is related to general relativity, not to special relativity, right? On the, on the other hand, nothing well, from special relativity is, uh, is being used in GPS. You're, you're, arguing, a, you're right. arguing a fine point here. Um, if they're saying that the, uh, um, you know, uh, relativity applies to GPS. So th this is a, a you know, this is, if you really this, want to get uh, into the debate, you could say. Straight, uh, how would say, I mean, None of these experiments ah, no. actually only, test the theory. Only that, and, and that correction is totally unnecessary, totally, ir totally irrelevant for the operation of the GPS system. That clock correction. All right, that's that's your opinion. Um, yeah, that, that's been discussed. I, I that's been discussed for years. No, I that, that's been discussed for years. Let's not my measurements, my measurements of GPS signal multiple propagation you serve in California showed that the second Einstein's postulate doesn't apply, doesn't hold. I got, I lost the job on that. And later I pursued that and there are very simple uh, moments, uh, si simple, simple, how I say, proof, very simple. Not to talk about this many, many things, you know, as you really kind of tried, I guess, to, to compile everything, you know. Very, very, uh, later I, I may come up with just maybe three, three points, after which, you simply forget about discussing about relativity in general. Thank you, sorry. Well, you know, I I'm not gonna, I'm not that, gonna no? discuss this. No? It's, you know, if you don't believe, if you don't believe that absorption, that's fine. Um, I got job too, you know? So please All right. proceed. Let, let me just interject one thing. Uh, my colleague, um, the late Ron Hatch was one of the primary designers of GPS and knew the data better than anyone. And the problem, and he was very clear that the GPS data did not support special relativity, but instead contradicted it. And the problem is that the data is correct only if you use a preferred frame, namely the Earth-centered inertial frame. The, if you change that frame uh, to another inertial frame, the more that frame differs from the ECI frame, the more inaccurate GPS becomes. So basically, GPS is built on a preferred frame system. Uh, and also uh, Tom Van Flandren, who was a, a key consultant to uh, GPS, wrote about the same thing. So just I'm just interjecting that. Thank you.
Well, if you start questioning all the experiments, then you know you're just left with nothing. That's the that's the problem. We have to have some kind of a hat to, you know, uh, something to to hang on to as some kind of proof, you know, that's uh, experimental if we're doing science. And um, you know, the relativists say um, these things are true that there is a slowing of clocks, but the point is that's really not correct if you understand what the mathematics of the theory says. That's the point. And the reason I'm bringing up Dingle is because Dingle sort of kept trying to get them to recognize this as a problem, and they basically didn't. That's really the point. They refused to sort of, he didn't really come out so much as say that special relativity is wrong and here's the reason why. He sort of tried to say it in a kind of a polite way that there's inconsistency. And I'll talk about this later, or there's contradictions. And it, that didn't really fly because, you know, we're dealing with people who, you know, we're right because we say so type of people. All right, I guess we're coming up to the end here. Well, just uh, one last remark here. Uh, Peter Jackson, Dr. Peter Jackson, who is uh, well, the last student of Freeman Dyson, a famous, famous uh, English physicist, informs me that Einstein recanted in the 1950s, I think in 52 or 55, I can't remember. He published a paper which does fit data much better than uh, uh, his older, older work. And uh, uh, Jackson is, uh, Peter Jackson is trying to push this. If you are on re ResearchGate, he is also on ResearchGate, and you can contact him and uh, get this paper of Einstein's in the 50s, shortly before he died, that uh, Jackson at least claims is uh, much more, uh, much better uh, as far as uh, modifying this, uh, his theory, which had so many problems that Einstein modified, had to modify. Well, he never really had a theory of special relativity. That's kind of the the, you know, the, what he said was contradictory and, you know, that his papers didn't agree. And then I've showed you this book here where he wrote uh, supposedly his manuscript where he was going to explain special relativity and be the definitive theory, but apparently he couldn't come up with a definitive theory and never got his manuscript published. And so there's really no Einstein statement that's a definitive statement on what special relativity actually is. He never really did that. Well, one quick. One quick uh, point here is that in 1916, Einstein, who by the way was very open-minded, I mean, he yet Harry is showing us he went back, he took criticism seriously and he changed his mind over and over again. But in 1916, Einstein recanted on his claim about the twin paradox, implying that he no longer believed that uh, the time dilation equation uh, was about physical slowing of clocks. And he said instead that the clock slowing was due to a virtual gravitational field when you accelerate. And That's, other physics. You're talking about other, 1918. It will, well, actually, the I thought I it was. It's, I think that's 1918 paper. You're okay. Reading. Well, anyways, um, and that confused few, me when you said 1916. Yeah, that, that's when he came out with the general relativity paper. So I thought that was uh, that was it. Anyways, that was my point. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk about the twin paradox in the next half hour. If, if anybody wants to continue with this. Uh, the point really basically is that um, if you get rid of the principle of relativity, then you get rid of the math errors and uh, the contradictions and the paradoxes. All right, I guess this segment, we're gonna, I'm going to talk a little bit about the twin paradox. I didn't talk about that. And um, Dingle was heavily involved in the, in the disputes over the twin paradox. Now, of course, the consensus of opinion as uh, here's the Martyr book. I don't know if everybody's heard of the Martyr book. Um, L. Martyr wrote a book about the twin paradox and he cited Time in the Space Traveler and he cited all 
And he really is. He says, basically, Dingle refused to accept the concept of time dilation. Um, and that's kind of his point, which I think is sort of disingenuous. So uh, one of the issues is that if you if you if you critique special relativity or say you disagree with it, um, you run the risk that what you'll say will be misinterpreted, and um, that's kind of one of the themes um, that we discover when we start looking at at Herbert Dingle and the controversies. So the I'm going to Langevin was the one who wrote the first paper about this where, um, you know, uh, he sort of came up with Jules Verne's uh, story. Jules Verne had this story about sending a rocket to the moon, I, I believe it was, and um, they were going to shoot people out of a cannon, giant cannon, and so the, that started this science fiction idea about a journey through space. And Langevin said that uh, a person who was traveling through space and then returned to Earth would be younger than um, his twin brother that stayed on the Earth. Einstein sort of repeated this in, uh, in a paper where he says that organisms in a rocket sent out in a rocket ship would age more slowly. And so that kind of implies that his theory would predict uh, asymmetrical aging. Now, Dingle uses the term asymmetrical aging in his papers. So I'm not really sure that I would say he invented that term, but um, he certainly did talk about asymmetrical versus symmetrical aging in, in the uh, twin paradox debate. Um, uh, now, Nick has already brought up the fact that Einstein sort of in 1918 published a paper based on general relativity in which he tried to justify his statement that he made uh, previously um, yeah, based on general relativity and the effect of acceleration. Now, the argument is that if the frame is accelerated, then kind of all, all bets are off. And that means that we can now distinguish which frame is the moving frame and which frame is the rest frame, because we know that one, the moving frame was accelerated. And therefore, that physically distinguishes that frame from the other frame. And so for some strange reason, the principle of relativity doesn't apply anymore. And um, so what the twin of paradox asserts is this dissimilarity in the passage of time or duration for the different states of motion, okay? And the explanation that relativists give is because of the difference in the frames as a re So we know which frame was moving and which frame was at rest because we put the moving frame into motion and then we brought it back to rest. And so therefore that kind of negates the principle of relativity. Now, um, I wanna talk about a little bit about Henry Bergson here. Here's his book, um, Duration and Simultaneity. This is a new version of the book. Um, it doesn't have Dingle's Introductor introduction. Dingle wrote an introduction to, uh, I think it was the 1964 edition of this book. And um, you can see that online. Now, I bought this book thinking that Dingle's uh, um, introduction was going to be in this book, but it wasn't in this book. That was a big disappointment to me. So, anyway, so the point of mentioning Bergson, Bergson kind of disputed this. A lot of the claims, particularly about the twin paradox, I'm not going to go into detail, uh, but the, suffice it to say, in this book, all of the rebuttals are, you know, this book gives pride of place in the appendix as to why uh, what Bergson said was wrong. Um, he apparently, that was really uh, upsetting to him. And uh, he apparently was silent on, on this whole issue for, um, uh, for the rest of his life. Um, here's a, I bring this up because I think it's kind of interesting. Um, uh, Arthur jo jo Lovejoy wrote a paper about this in a, in a philosophy journal in 1931 where he was talking about this. And um, that 
<laughs> precipitated a big battle. And there was a big exchange, and this is in a philosophy journal in 1931. So this issue of the twin paradox has been debated in philosophical circles and scientific circles um, for quite a few years. I mean, it's not a new um, phenomenon. Um, okay, now Dingle got involved in the 1950s uh, with this uh, twin paradox debate. And his point was he didn't understand how any of these claims about the twin paradox could be true because even the, ex the acceleration phase of the um, journey, if you will, the, the twin paradox journey was too short to have any significant effect on the rate of the clock. And so therefore the, um, uh, difference in aging, the asymmetrical aging, had to be due to the um, relativistic effect of the difference in velocities. But then Dingle said, wait a minute, according to the principle of relativity, there can't be any difference between the clocks. Okay, so that doesn't explain it for me. And this, his resistance to that argument um, is well documented and then there's a lot of disputes about that. So does anybody have any, wanna make any comments or questions about the twin paradox? Um, it's a big problem, been discussed over and over again. They claim that it's now settled science, but the issue in my mind is, I don't see how it could be settled science unless you can somehow demonstrate why it is that the principle of relativity doesn't apply to the twin paradox. Well, uh, uh, that's the explanation of uh, Andre Michel, who is now editor of the General Science Journal, is that and he has two books out, and he says there's quantum mechanical reasons why a uh, clock moving faster should uh, uh, go slower relative, you know, to the ECI frame, and uh, I, I I haven't read it in detail, but he says it's a, a quantum mechanical effect that means that the cesium atom doesn't vibrate as fast as it used to uh, for some reason when it's not in the ECI frame, and but near, relatively near the Earth. Pardon me for saying this, Dennis, but that just sounds like. Um you know, a way of trying to keep the principle of relativity when it's obviously wrong. Well, the principle of relativity is wrong, but but uh, the uh, the going clocks going slower outside the Earth, uh, say in orbit, uh, is correct experimentally, and according to uh, Michaud's uh, theory, his quantum theory. Well, I can't comment. I'm not really knowledgeable about quantum mechanics, so I can't say anything about that. Um, two, two quick comments. Um, uh, there were lots of logic arguments about why the twin paradox claimed by Einstein and uh, that clock slowing was due to uh, the time dilation equation. But uh, what really puts it to rest is the GPS data because GPS data and the data from CERN on um, the, the slowing of aging of uh, or decay of particles both require that the base frame for you measuring velocity is the ECI frame. So it's, it's the effect is absolute velocity. And you kind of jumped to the to the solution. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Well, yeah, you're right. I mean, the point is, if you if you the principle of relativity sort of basically is a problem. It's a problem for the math, and it's a problem for the experiments. And um, you know, by holding on to the principle of relativity as to being a fundamental principle of physics, rather than by saying, okay, maybe we should be looking at this. Do the experiments you know, disprove this uh, hypothesis. Um, no, they sort of jump to the conclusion that the experiments must prove that Einstein's right because Einstein made some, well, depending upon your point of view, some people say, uh, well, he 
his predictions and what he said in 1905 wasn't really correct. And he didn't really mean to say that. And that was a slip on Einstein's part. So that's kind of an excuse to get away from that. Um, you know, the, the problem remain, the point here that I'm trying to get at is that um, uh, the principle of relativity, if you keep it, kind of leads you into the problem that the mathematics doesn't work out because as McRae demonstrated in his paper, the only time that you get a solution to the equations for the two different clocks is when the velocity, relative velocity of the clocks is zero. So that just kind of basically means special relativity is correct mathematically, but its only solution is for V equals zero where there's no motion. So it has no physical meaning. But uh, it, it has been decided, um, you know, it conventionally, uh, th that relativity is correct for, for all velocities. Um, and to get over this problem that you've, you mentioned about uh, asymmetry, in other words, non-reciprocity, because if all frames are equal, you should have this. Um, there are various explanations because as I say, they've decided a priori that, that it is correct. So um, Al Kelly in his book, uh, Challenging Modern Physics in, in the appendix gives, I think in excess of 30 different explanations where, where they're, they're, you know, they're just trying to justify their, their, their ideas which, which, which have been taken uh, without question. Now, now this acceleration business um, is just one of them. Uh, so uh, as I think you pointed out, Harry, that uh, the acceleration could actually, uh, acceleration and deceleration could actually occur in an infinitesimal amount of time. And it's very hard to understand how the complete lack of re reciprocity could be caused by such um, a phenomenon. But as I say, it's only one of maybe in excess of 30 attempted explanations, which, which is very suspicious because it, it seems to indicate that the, the mainstream scientists, uh, you know, going right back, um, have been trying to save something that, 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 that is, is actually on the face of it contradictory. That, that's it exactly. They're trying to save. What are they trying to save? Well, if you use uh, the Lorentz Fitzgerald transformation, in electrodynamics, you can often completely simplify problems. Otherwise, it would take months of hard work to work out mathematically if you could do it at all. So I want to get to um, you know talk a little bit about um, Dingle's poorly phrased arguments. Okay, now what this illustrates is if you say things, then you know um, what he said was that special relativity is inconsistent. Now, um, you know, there's an inconsistency, okay? There's something not really quite right. Now, I think by saying this, uh, saying that there's an inconsistency with the theory, now he published a number of different papers that showed different kinds of inconsistencies, beginning with the paper that I showed on the relativity of time, where he showed that the clocks, all these different clocks didn't all comply with the uh, time effect of special relativity, um, you know, people basically would go through a, a refutation saying, well, you know, they define inconsistently inconsistency differently. Now, what Good did, did was he said special relativity is, in, is perfectly consistent. The math of special relativity is completely, totally consistent. And he goes through all this, I mean, just pages after page after page of proving that mathematically it's perfectly correct. Notice I said proving mathematically that it's perfectly correct. It's not inconsistent. Okay, it would be, uh, and of course, good use the 1907, the as observed or just observed version of SR. And um, so, if, you know, what, is, what does the word inconsistency mean? That, that, that's kind of a problem. Um, then Dingle also said that special relativity involves a logical contradiction. Um, and, you know, it seemed to me kind of obvious what he meant by logical contradiction. But, you know, the way these people who defend relativity are, they sort of can say, well, it's not really a logical contradiction. It's not really a logical contradiction. You know, and they, you know, like, like, okay, you know, it's not really a logical contradiction. Now, in the case of uh, McRae, uh, what he did was he said, well, what Dingle said 
um, because he said that uh, the clocks, each of the two clocks must run slower than the other, McRae, and that is a contradiction. It's contradictory for the clocks to each run slower than the other because the principle of relativity requires that must be the case. Uh, McRae went through this argument and said, well, it turns out that uh, you can't say that because uh, of his proof that the clocks really don't run slow because they can't run slow. They have to run at the same rate. So Dingle was wrong because the clocks must run at the same rate, but Dingle said that they run at different rates. And so therefore, Dingle's logical contradiction is false. Wow, that was complicated. <laughs> um, and also you're gonna get into trouble if you say, um, uh, Dingle kind of made the assumption and he started off saying this at the very, uh, in uh, one of his papers, he said, well, most physicists believe that special relativity requires clocks to work at different rates. Work means that the clocks run at different rates, tick at different rates, if you will. Um, you know, and so that's not really, you know, you know I.J. Good made a big deal out of saying, well, that was the wrong theory of relativity. You really don't understand what relativity says. So you get into, if, you, if, you, if you're a critic and you try to make a, you know, an argument that sort of defines what's wrong, then you know, it's, it's very difficult to do without somebody deliberately misinterpreting what you said. And, um, and, so now we're back to the last point that Nick has already uh, banged on. It says, do not leave it to critics to say which version of SR you're dealing with. Okay, good, good exploited this one um, uh, very extensively by saying that uh, Dingle didn't really um, uh, have the right version of special relativity. He should have realized that that it's the observer sees the clock in the moving frame running slow. It doesn't actually run slow. So Dingle is wrong. Well, yeah, but that really wasn't the issue that Dingle was really trying to point out to them. He was trying to point out to them that the principle of relativity kind of forces you into these problems of dealing with contradictions, inconsistencies, incorrect mathematics, and uh, the other assorted things. Um, Okay, here's the last point. Do not imply that time dilation is invalid. That's one of the points that um, Martyr makes in his book. Here's Martyr's book. He says that, and a lot of uh, people say, Dingle denied time dilation. He said that time dilation didn't exist. That's obviously wrong. Well, that's not what Dingle said. <laughs> Dingle said that it was hard to accept the existence of time dilation if the principle of relativity was correct. They leave out the last part. So Dingle's obviously wrong because they said so. Um, now, um, well, that, that's anything, Harry. That's uh, I guess we can talk about GPS. We've already talked about it a little bit in, in the next section. Um, so I guess we have a few minutes here, maybe 10 minutes to um, make any comments. <clears throat> yes, I would like to indicate for as far as I know that uh, the, um, the the principle of relativity um, was conceived for point particles. In other words, the, the time dilation can be rigorously de defined mathematically and not um, under the assumption that it applies to point part. Lorentz transformation applies to point part. The calculus, uh, Newton calculus or only applies to a po dimensionless point. Now, um, we know now that the moment you admit an, um, a dimension, an extension or a structure, then, the, the, then there are um, an, uh, mathematically, already at mathematical level, there are clear deviation in the, from, the, from the theoretical prediction of a, or the limit for the point uh, uh, or conceiving uh, the structure as a point. The, um, this has been, there's been uh, experimental evidence. I circulated a, a paper some a week or so ago regarding the experimental evidence that the time dilation does not apply for the behavior of, uh, of unstable uh, chaos with speed. And this is now has been, is, is accepted for, uh, for all uh, time dilation does not apply. It's not exactly valid for extended particle with a structure. 
This has been an Aronson experiment at Fermilab in 1983, proving what I'm stating from, uh, uh, from zero to 100 um, G um, electron volts. So now, I, honestly, I do not know the connection of this, the, the, uh, of this inapplicability or violation of, of the time dilation for extended particle with your argument. But back to GPS, for instance, um, mathematically, I will not even know how to define the principle of relativity for, uh, for the equipment, the GPS, because the GPS is not a point. And the, 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 the essence of mathematics uh, throughout, the, you know, in the special relativity is only four points. Think about and always Newton, Leibniz calculus is only, can only be defined at, uh, at one point, dimensionless point. The moment you try to extend it, you cannot apply it. So you cannot even formulate the principle of relativity. That, this is what I know. I do not know whether this makes sense, but I agree that, um, that, uh, the, that the principle of relativity is, is not exactly valid for the real world, even for extended particles. This is my personal view. Yes, you make a good point, uh, Professor Santilli. For example, it would not apply to an hourglass clock. Yes. Uh, exactly. However, that's... however, we, in terms of applying uh, special relativity to physics, we know that the process that drives the atom of uh, the atomic clocks is a, an atomic process, and that process does seem to slow down as a function of absolute velocity to the local preferred frame as proved by the data from both uh, uh, GPS and the CERN laboratory. Yes. So it seems to me that the true physics of, you know, process, atomic, fundamental atomic processes slowing down is a function of absolute velocity and not relative velocity. Look, uh, really, uh, Connected to the I, 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 I cannot can, cannot stand wondering why why, why people uh, cannot uh, get the basic uh, uh, issues there. You know, first issue, or out of maybe of two or three. First one is that light is not propagating in whatever space uh, either. Sure, you know, uh, as uh, sounds propagate in air, it propagate differently. So. Many errors have been made in uh, uh, designing the experiments as uh, Magnuson Morley and many, many. So emission theory is working. So uh, the, the ba basic contradiction has been kind of uh, pointed to recently by uh, Dr. Engelhardt. He, 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 he is retired from uh, Max Planck Institute in Germany or something like, like that. Yes. So, uh, uh, Einstein's paper starts with uh, x equals uh, c times t and x prime equals c t prime. That means velocity of light is c with respect to the emi emitter. And he says, if this is okay, in, not in contradiction with what follows, then we go on. And actually the paper ends with uh, making <laughs> both times and uh, 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 how I say lengths in both, both systems interrelated. You know, at that point, everybody should, should start reading the whatever came after that. Yes, I know Professor, I mean, uh, Eberhard, I haven't read that paper, but he's a the, very the good critical decided, thinker. And open-minded. Uh, Einstein's third postulate. Einstein's third postulate. Yeah. A very short paper. Very, very, very compelling. Mm. I'll try and get that paper. And, and very positive. Thing. So, so uh, you know, many, many things. Uh, the, 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 the binary star, binary star experiment, you know, uh, observations have been used as an ultimate proof that emission theory cannot work. And actually, Emission theory, theory, taking it into account, re-emission means everything. And and, and really uh, uh, thoughtful, uh, uh, how say, analysis of, uh, of that case reveals that 
special theory of relativity cannot explain it. And I sent uh, uh, the presentation about the Milankovic dealing with uh, special relativity. That was something that he was very much kind of, uh, uh, I would say, occupied with. And after he uh, made some in initial works and results in the, in, in, in the uh, domain of the uh, climate changes, you know, it, it is uh, known, famous now, now that's been on that, he wanted actually to work on this uh, in the same way. And uh, at that time came that, that uh, conference in California, uh, where was it, uh, 27, I think, or whatever, and they considered the, the, the big binary star experiments <laughs> and concluded that the emission theory cannot, cannot uh, explain it, but did not prove that the special theory can explain it. So this guy is very, very say, famous and, and astute scientist, has actually shown that special that the second postulate cannot be used there to, to explain. So I mean, uh, as I told you, uh, that was the first uh, moment that I uh, uh, got uh, how say uh, uh, into the physics. You know, I lost job because of my results on GPS signal multiple propagation revealed that uh, reflected components that have different Doppler, higher Doppler than the line of sight, can arrive earlier than the line of sight signal. I lost job because of that, and I start looking at so many, many people uh, on, on, on the opposite side, and many, many good kind of, uh, I'll say, uh, insights about about contradiction and so on. And later, actually, it was that I by chance got farther into the physics. But you know, that's something really that's totally clear to me. It could be totally clear to anyone. We just this couple of or two, 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 two things. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how um, what I've said before previously about let's just ditch the principle of relativity and what doing that does to the mathematics. So what happens is now um, my claim, my claim is that Einstein uh, did the wrong math, got the wrong mathematics, uh, set physics in the wrong direction because of his insistence on the um, principle of relativity had to be correct. That was the whole, you know, that, you know, his papers were all titled about relativity. His theory is the theory of relativity, which implies the principle of relativity. That principle is wrong, and his mathematics is wrong as a result of that, and that's what's caused all these controversies for all these years. Um, so that's my thesis. Yeah, I, I'll comment on your last statement. Um, I think if you look at the relativity principle and see that it leads to relative simultaneity, you don't necessarily come to the relativity principle, you know, throw it out the window, but but of necessity, it does strip out a lot about what you can say about physics. Because you can never, if every, if it's the relativity principle really is observer centric and it says all observers are equally accurate in their description of what's happening. But um, that throws out a lot of cause and effect. So there's a whole, that guarantees an awful lot of, of physics cannot be commented on if you use the general principle of relativity. However, uh, you can see those things that are Lorentz invariant and those things that are Lorentz invariant seem to uh, be consistent with uh, you can uh, talk about it consistent with the general principle, the general relativity principle. Well, That's I was going to talk about simultaneity and kind of the issue that you raised in the next half hour segment. Oh, good. Look at this. Look, look at this. Why talking about simultaneity when in the GPS system? Uh, am I here? No. Well, I say right here, yeah. GPS is, GPS is, is no. based on system. absolute simultaneity. You know, in GPS system, it is used the absolute time. 
uh, frame Correct. Position. Yeah. So I mean, <laughs> GPS is not it does not and allow you know, relativity if, of simultaneity. If you don't, time if, is if absolute. You don't take, if you don't take correction of Doppler offset onto the the the, the correlation peaks uh, detections, you are not getting good uh, receiver. And what uh, the late uh, Ron Hatch did. I mean, that was something that I was, uh, I would say, uh, very much uh, fond of and uh, was expected to be supported in, in, in my findings. Uh, but later I found that he was combining different things, you know, how I say, uh, uh, utilitarianly, you know, and then he really uh, attained very, very good results with, with, with the GPS receiver there, you know. But, you know, that's the fact. So no, 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 no special activity uh, is used in the GPS system. I would like to apologize. I cannot attend the next meeting because of an engagement, but this is very interesting, uh, very, very interesting exchange. I appreciate the being part. Thank you. Well, thank you for coming. Of course. Okay, it looks like we have six minutes left. Um, there, was a, there was an issue. At the point regarding the absolute time and connection with the ether, as a, there appears to be a very deep connection uh, with um, the ether as a universal substratum. But this is for people who, who believe, like me, that, uh, that when electromagnetic waves cannot propagate in, uh, on nothing, and they need a physical medium. And uh, so, and automatically, once this is admitted, then uh, then the the, the this the, the truth, you know, of the GPS, I believe, emerges very, very forcefully. Incidentally, I do not believe that um, the existence of the ether as a universal substratum violates special relativity, because the, we humans cannot, um, can, in my opinion, again, I, I don't expect to be uh, correct. I just express my uh, any disagreement, please. Uh, thank you. But uh, we, um, I believe that we human cannot um, identify experimentally in a, a frame which is addressed with, um, with the ether as a universal substratum because of the principle of inertia. We, are, uh, you know, we will never know uh, that we are in indeed addressed uh, with respect to the ether. And since we will never know, so we will not see a violation, um, a violation uh, uh, of, um, but again, when I speak uh, with special relativity, I, I, I only uh, refer to, uh, under the, the condition which can be rigorously mathematically defined and elaborated, namely for point particles only. The moment there is an extension, uh, there are deviations, uh, in my, my view. Go ahead, Roger. Hello, yeah. I've uh, talked to, can you hear me first? Yeah. Yes. Uh, right. I've talked to a lot of people about relativity and they seem to believe lots of different theories. They say they believe in special relativity, but when you kind of get into it, they they all believe lots of different things. And there's sort of one version of it that uh, it's, they believe that it's not a relativity theory. And by that, they think the theory has been mis misnamed as relativity and really it's about invariance. You're not doing, which I take to mean you're not really dealing with the principle of relativity. You're just looking at things that are invariant between frames. So there are things that Einstein says uh, about his theory being misnamed and it's really a theory of invariance. And I think it was Max Planck who called it a theory of relativity. And uh, Einstein at first didn't like it being called that, but eventually he just accepted that name. So really, you, you're in a mess as to what the theory really is supposed to be from the very beginning. Because if you can take it as a theory of invariance and I believe that Einstein made lots of mathematics mistakes, you can then take it as that sort of theory. Well, um, just to you know, put a point on it, but that was Minkowski's theory, okay, the invariance that arises from Minkowski. And I really didn't, not really talking about Minkowski, just talking about what Einstein says. 
Yes. And so you have to sort of put limits around what we're talking about. But what you're talking about, about, about the invariances uh, has to do with Ms. Minkowski, and that's a whole other bag of worms, in my opinion. Um, so, yeah, you could, you know, those people, Dingle ran into that with Bourne. Uh, Dingle published a paper in Nature where he was talking about an inconsistency, and then Bourne came back with uh, his response, and Bourne drew this Minkowski diagram and made you know, that because the uh, Boren said, because the diagram shows such and such, therefore what Dingle said was wrong. And it kind of infuriated Dingle because he said, how do you prove me wrong by just producing a diagram? <laughs> but I, I think it's the, it, Einstein, uh, his friend Max Planck was calling it our theory of relativity. And so well, that's I don't know where the name came from. I just, I just know that yeah. in 1907, the, yeah. the title uh, is Relativity, and yeah. all the papers after that, he talks about, he starts with an introduction about the principle of relativity. And what he's saying is that the, his theory that follows is based on the principle of relativity, and that's why he talks, that's why relativity is is um, what he's calling his theory. The principle of relativity is the fundamental principle from which his theory is derived. Okay. So my point is, if that principle is wrong, everything, he, you know, his whole theory just falls to the ground. I, I've always advocated, though, um, a distinction between uh, the term relativity and special relativity. Um, I, I, I mean, um, the, the postulates of the special theory of relativity on the face of it are quite innocuous. Um, you know, it's a bit like uh, Newton's first law, uh, you know, that all objects will, will continue in a state of motion at rest unless um, impressed upon by, by an external force, except insofar as they don't. So in other words, they'll do that in an ideal condition if there's no friction or if there's no air resistance. Really? But the, prin the, the, the principle appears to be like the classical principle of relativity. And the second postulate is correct in the way it's stated in the 1905 paper that um, the speed of light is independent of the speed of the source. It's only when you take everything to be... All right. So we're back to where I'm going to talk about GPS. Now, <clears throat> uh, in GPS, time is absolute. So it, it really doesn't follow um, the relative time uh, assertion. So you have absolute simultaneity. And what that means is that the clocks are all supposed to be running at the same rate. So you have clocks on the satellites, clocks on the ground. They're all coordinated to uh, universal coordinated time, but not exactly or 100%. So you have what's called GPS time. But GPS time is supposed to basically mirror UTC, uh, which is, um, and that's usually the abbreviation, but that, that's French for, I think that this is universal coordinated time. Okay, UTC. Um, now, the point is, the reason why I'm bringing this up is um, uh, GPS adjusts the clocks to run fast. Okay, well, we're just going to talk about special relativity for the moment, not general relativity. So just assume that there's two different corrections. There's a correction for general relativity and special relativity. I'm going to talk about special relativity. And there's a point for why I'm talking about this. And what GPS does is it makes the clock run, the satellite clocks are set to run fast before they are launched into orbit. And the thesis is once they're in orbit, they run slow. So if we make them run fast by the same amount that they run slow as a fraction, so we adjust the clocks to run fast, then when they're in orbit, they run slow, and then that means they will run at the same rate on the Earth as they do in orbit. That's the thesis. Now, there's nothing in special relativity that says you can do this, okay? And, but I'm, it's, we're going to get to my point here. Now, my point is that um, special relativity doesn't use the right equations, okay? If you use the equations based on the principle of relativity, you get the equation T prime equals beta T and T equals beta T prime, which only have a solution T equals T. 
Okay, time, the clocks have to be at the same rate. Okay, so the clock can't run slower when you put it into orbit according to the, the um, principle of relativity. It can only run at the same rate. Okay, now, if we change the equations, and there's a reason for this, we make it so that instead of the two equations being uh, inconsistent, there's that word inconsistent or contradictory, um, which is the, what Dingle said, we make these equations so that they're inverses, okay? Mathematical inverses. Well, of course, relativists say, no, these equations are inverses. It's the inverse Lorentz transform. No, that's not exactly correct mathematics. Okay, so we say, the equations now become t prime equals beta t and t equals t prime divided by beta. Okay, and you see that we have these inverses. The second equation is a mathematical inverse of the first equation. And that is what justifies this procedure of adjusting the clocks on the ground. Okay, because you now have an inverse relationship. They're, they're, the mathematics is inversely related. So here's my point. My point is we couldn't do this before because there's the wrong mathematics. The wrong mathematics essentially forces you into all these contradictions in special relativity. It's the wrong mathematics. They have the, in technical language, it's an incorrect mathematical system. It's, and that's probably what Dingle was trying to say when he said uh, there's an inconsistency in the special relativity theory. That may have been what he was talking about, but he didn't really have the mathematical formulism to say this. And what happened was that um, McRae uh, actually provided the solution mathematically. These two equations, the uh, Lorentz transformation of time, which is T prime equals beta T, and its inverse transformation, T equals beta T prime, those equations only have a solution for T equals T prime, which implies that beta equals zero. So there's no velocity, there's no, so yeah, um, special relativity is consistent, but it only has this solution. You, you mean beta <laughs> equals one? Yes. Harry? Yes. You, well, you said beta equals zero. Um, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. The velocity, me others? the velocity is zero and beta equals one. Okay, uh, you're saying there's two, two equations one being the inverse of the other. To me, it just looks like one equation being rearranged uh, algebraically, that there really isn't two equations there. Uh, what am I missing here? Okay, good point. I'm glad you gave me the opportunity to explain. Um, this is kind of complicated because of the, the, I've simplified this to avoid the issue of the, the Lorentz transformations of time. There's the Lorentz transformation, excuse me, and the inverse Lorentz transformation of time. Now, Einstein said exactly what you said. He said they're mirror images of each other because of symmetry required by the principle of relativity. So when he writes his paper in the 1907, 1910, 1911 papers, he just says, by symmetry, here's the inverse Lorentz transformation. We can change the variables t and t prime in the equation. So that's what he does. He just exchanges t and t prime. Just, they just exchange places because of the principle of uh, relativity justifies that procedure. You got that? Well, uh, I'm just seeing one equation, uh, one relationship, uh, being expressed algebraically in two different ways. I, I'm, I'm not seeing one relation being the inverse of the other. Uh, oh, you're confused here. What I said. Maybe that's yeah. just terminology that you're calling an no, algebraic no, no, no. rearrangement of your first equation on the left, uh, t equals uh, t prime equals beta t. Uh, is just the second equation is, is just uh, the same thing uh, rearranged. Algebra. That's what an inverse is, basically. 
<laughs> oh, 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 okay. So that's the terminology we're using. Okay, thank okay, you. Now, here's the point I want to make. This is the point. That if I'm, okay, so this is the point that's confusing. This is the whole point I'm trying to get at. This is the mathematical mistake. Einstein used the procedure of T and T prime get um, exchanged in positions. And so that gives you the equation T prime equals beta T and T equals beta T prime, which only has a solution T equal to T prime. That's the only solution. And that gives you beta equals one and velocity equal to zero. So there's no motion. Now, that was what McRae presented to refute Dingle. This is really the whole point. <laughs> so McRae's refutation of Dingle didn't refute Dingle. It just disproved special relativity. Okay. Now, what I'm saying here on this slide is let's use the real inverse, not Einstein's supposed inverse, which is a symmetry inverse. He calls it an inverse, but it's not. That's the whole point. Einstein used the wrong inverse because he derived the inverse from the principle of relativity and in doing that said that all we have to do to get the inverse is to exchange the variables in the equation and we get the inverse equation for the Lorentz transformation. And when you do that, you don't get the right answer mathematically. That's the problem. Okay. Have I made that kind of clear to people? <laughs> this is really a key point. What kind of equations are those? Then? <laughs> I didn't really hear yeah. that. I mean, but, but, but look at wherever you have that uh, uh, v over c squared, both squared, right? That's that in this beta. Comes, that actually comes from the very uh, basic flow assumption that the light propagates in space or ether as sound in the air. That is wrong. And out of that actually came that factor with Lorentz as well and with all others. And whoever has that factor in their formula, you know, that should be invalidated. There is no sense at all. Really cannot, I, I, I cannot really believe how, how many people cannot just get very simple things, you know. Okay, well, my point here is that um, if we use this inverse equation that I have here in the third bullet, okay, um, then, we, then we have a different theory. We have, and here's one of the important points, we're no longer using the principle of relativity, okay? So now we got the correct equations, okay? We don't have the wrong equations. So what has happened in special relativity and uh, what Dingle was trying to say is that if you believe in the principle of relativity, you're going to get these contradictions and inconsistencies. And this has been a theme basically from the beginning of the introduction of the special relativity, these, these paradoxes and contradictions because the, the, of this mathematical mistake that starts off at the very beginning. Okay. Um, now, my point here in the, in the last uh, point is, well, we won't have a pr twin paradox anymore because if we use the, what they did for GPX, ah, sorry, GPS, what we do is when we send the twin off into space, we calculate how fast he's going relative to the Earth, and we just make an adjustment to the clock. So his clock on the uh, space. Yes, please runs at the same rate as the clocks on the ground, and now we don't have a paradox in aging anymore. So we can get rid of the paradox uh, because essentially the paradox was produced in the first place by wrong mathematics. Okay. Hello. Can I speak? Hello. Do you want to say something? Yeah, please. Um, I th think you should have put down um, what Einstein's inverse was, because I think what you're saying, Einstein's inverse is, given T prime equal beta T, then by the relativity principle, T would equal beta T prime, instead of the inverse you've shown. And 
that's where all the mess is coming from. But he's that but Einstein is then introducing the relativity of simultaneity to make things even more confusing. Well, I discussed that earlier. Yeah. Um, that, but that it would was, have helped that if you put down the two types of inverse in that. Well, here it is right here. Mathematical formulation. Here they are. Okay. He, okay. I already talked about that. I thought maybe you understood that. Um, yeah. I only got into this discussion the way I did was because of the uh, question raised yeah. uh, about where does the inverse come from and what you're talking about. Actually, you know, this you saying that that the Lorentz trans the, the inverse transformation, calling it an inverse is kind of a, a problem. And when and that was one of the first things I got hung up on was it wasn't an inverse and that was kind of obvious to me. And so how do you call it an inverse? But, you know, they have a, a bunch of mathematical trickery they get around that. But it's really, as I've explained on numerous times, it's really the dual, okay? Um, that what they call the inverse transformation or the inverse Lorentz transformation is really the dual, okay? And that gets you into a lot of other, that's down, that's really getting into the mathematical weeds. Can, can, I, can I say something that I, I think might help explain your two equations there. Uh, see if you agree with this, Harry. You're saying t prime equals beta t if you're in the unprimed coordinate system and you're talking about the clock in the prime coordinate system. Then if you go to the prime coordinate system and you look at the unprime coordinate system, you have exactly the same equation, t equals beta t prime. I mean, it's just reciprocal. It's just a reciprocal way of looking at things. Well, yes, but... The point is that Einstein uses the word symmetry. They're yes. symmetrical because of the principle of relativity is symmetrical. Right. That's really the point I'm trying to get at. Um, it's not this second inverse Lorentz transformation is not an inverse in the strict mathematical sense, with, which you usually would define it. It's a dual. Now, to, for me to explain what the dual is, it it's, comes from the dual space. I don't know how many people here know about the, uh, the this mathematics of the dual space. Yeah, that's uh, kind of advanced algebra. Okay, I'm, I'm kind of off. Okay, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the light clock. Okay, now, <laughs> is there... Um, you see my light clock here? Yes. What, what a problem I have with the light clock is that uh, they use this as an example of a proof of the time dilation. Okay, so, all right, here's the clock at rest and it's bouncing up and down. Okay, now then in B, you have this clock where it's bouncing along the diagonal. Okay, so the path is longer in B than at A. Now the clock at B is moving, okay? And that's why the path is longer. The, so, and so they say, well, this is an example of time dilation. Sounds good, except for by the principle of relativity, the same thing has to be true for the B clock and the A clock changing places. And so now the B clock, which, is now in the place of the A clock because we shifted our point of view between frames, it's not actually running slower in its own frame. Oh, why is that? Why is it, how can you say, so this is kind of gets to Dingle's point, which is how can both, how can you say that the clock B is running slow relative to the clock A when I'm perfectly entitled to reverse the roles of the two clocks? In which case now the B clock is now the A clock and it's pretty obvious that it's not experiencing any time dilation. I think the, the, the problem is in the, uh, how say, inappropriate conception of the or understanding of uh, coordinate systems or coordinate frames, first of all. You know, uh, we actually, in any coordinate system, every point is present in every of those coordinate systems at the same point, at the same time point, at the same point of space, you know? So only when we are supposed to communicate, commun to communicate events 
in particular frames, one or the other, or from one to the other, comes into the question, what is the, the speed of propagation of the means by which we provide that information? And if it is velocity c, then one has to uh, really be sure how to do that. Whether it's the c with respect to the whatever uh, emitter, or it is independent of the uh, velocity of uh, emitter, as is the case with sound in the air. And that later one is really totally wrong, totally kind of... So, you know what I mean? <laughs> Why not think about, about those things? You know? If you got into it, you know, you, there is no ever, there is no ending of, 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 of considering thinking, you know, everyone by himself and between each other and so on and so on. And so on. Well, my point here on talking about the light. Okay, this is wrong, and I don't care about that. No. All right. Well, anyway, my point about the light clock as an example is that it can only be correct if there's an absolute frame. Okay. It and as soon as you start introducing the principle of relativity, it, it becomes illogical. Okay. Yeah. And that's, that's the whole point. You know, how, it, it's just an illogical. And um, I don't really think that um, relativity books do you themselves know, the any favors has, by talking yeah, about this as yeah. proof of time dilation. The undertone, uh, the, uh, Robert said uh, in the beginning, that actually everything should be about the uh, invariance, you know, invariance that, uh, that turned out to be kind of uh, general covariance. And then, you know, there's something uh, uh, how, how came up, uh, came out with Einstein's uh, intentions and desire to combine special relativity with the uh, uh, dynamics uh, theory, you know? And uh, we have to stick uh, 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 with invariance. Covariance in sense of invariance, not covariance in sense of putting into the, uh, those, uh, how say, how say, um, uh, inconsistence uh, formulations of special relativity. Well, and my, my personal opinion is that if Einstein had made his mistake, we wouldn't be needing to talk about the Minkowski version of special relativity. He would have had a consistent mathematics that worked. Everything wrong. Everything is wrong. Wherever you see V over C squared, that doesn't make any sense, should not make any sense. Okay, well, I want to talk a little bit about uh, relativity of simultaneity. And the reason why I talked about the light clock is the same kind of contradiction arises. And when you're talking about Einstein, this, um, this is kind of like from, Einstein gave the example and I was talking about this book here. This is the, the, the famous book, you know, for a popular version of special relativity or relativity in general for the average guy. Okay, and he gives the example of the train and the embankment and um, says, well, you know, there, you have this relativity of time, but the relativity of time depends on the fact that you've said one frame is, is the preferred frame and the other frame is the moving frame. Okay, now you get, you know, a difference in the time of the events. But now if you use the principle of relativity and you reverse the roles of the frames, this principle of relativity and the simultaneity, relativity of simultaneity doesn't make sense anymore. You know, which frame is the rest frame? Which frame is the moving frame? That goes back to Dingle's argument about which clock is moving and which clock is rest. You know, since we can switch the frames by the principle of relativity, you know, tell me which clock's running slow. Okay, and so this didn't really you know, they didn't really want to accept these arguments. Um, but in effect, basically, is if you accept the principle of relativity and you use that in the mathematics, you're basically heading off in the wrong direction and you get a lot, basically you get bad mathematics and contradictions and the Minkowski invariance doesn't solve the problem. It doesn't solve that problem because if you solve the problem using Minkowski diagrams, you still get the contradictions and you still get the, uh, in it, you know, the confusion. And I mean, you, you will still get the fact that um, 
there's a contra, you know, if you, you get these paradoxes, uh, you know, there's a whole Panam, whole bunch of them. You get paradoxes. If you do calculations using length contraction, you get contradictions. There's a bunch of contradictions uh, regarding that. If you deal with time, you get the clock paradox contradictions. Okay. And there's just, I mean, people have spent, I mean, if, if you were to sit down and do a catalog of all the paradoxes that have been published as, uh, you know, using the special theory of relativity, it'd be a gigantic, you know, long compendium. Um, so where does all this come from? It comes from the principle of relativity and the this um, incorrect usage of the Lorentz and the inverse Lorentz transformation. The inverse Lorentz transformation that they use is incorrect. And if you use that, then you're going to get all these paradoxes. If you stick only to the Lorentz transformation, okay, then you're kind of sort of almost okay, because as long as you don't try to do the inverse, you don't try to go backwards, um, you're okay. If you go, so that's why you can do these calculations um, in um, uh, accelerators and that sort of thing, because you're using only one of the Lorentz transformations. But if you try to use the other one and prove that they, you, you're going to get contradictions, that's basically the story. Well, I would disagree with that. Uh, uh, Nick uh, has given me the name of a physicist uh, in California by the name of uh, uh, Kelsey, uh, who uh, maintains that uh, uh, mass gain with velocity, relativistic velocity, is an illusion. Uh, and uh, I've emailed him the other day and tried to get any papers he's written on that or not. But also, uh, Don, Dr. Don Lincoln of Fermilab is another one who says that mass gain with uh, relativistic velocity is an illusion. So, if, But if you use the Lorentz transform, you get mass gain with velocity. Well, that's not what I was talking about. That's a fine point. Um, my view is that what really ha what the Lorentz transform really does is tells you about how the units of measure and the how they transform, how the units of measure transform. Okay, and that gets you into why the um, inverse Lorentz transform is the dual, because you have the transformation of the basis of measurement and then you have the transformation of the coordinates of measurement. But this is really beyond my scope of discussion at the present time. Yeah, good, good point. What about units? What about physical units? All well, physical should, be, should, should, should undergo transformations, right? Well, so I, talking I, about that, right? <laughs> hold on. I talked about that and I didn't really emphasize that point very well. That's what GPS does. GPS changes the units of time that the clock is measuring. Okay. So what you do is you're changing the units. You do that by adjusting the unit of time in the satellite clocks versus the ground clocks. So no. the main reason I'm bringing up GPS is because it illustrates the fact that you're changing the um, unit of time measure in the satellite clocks, okay? You're changing the unit of climate time measure. Now, special relativity, if you really interpret it correctly, says there can't be a change in the clock in special relativity. All the clocks have to run at the same rate. And by implication, you would think that that has to be true for general relativity as well. Using GPS as an example. Okay, I'm not talking about, you know, we could have a presentation, just talk about GPS. My point is, I'm trying to explain essentially why the mathematics, how the mathematics got messed up. It got messed up because of the principle of relativity. Right. The principle of relativity requiring um, that the transformations had to be symmetrical because of the principle of relativity. And that required that you 
uh, subs that you exchange the variables. Okay, now once you have these uh, transformations called the Lorentz transformation and its inverse and you start using them, you find out that you've got all these problems and the math doesn't work. Well, instead of fixing that problem, they invented you know, ways around it. And I suspect that the Minkowski idea and the invariance idea is one of the ways they can get around that. But that has this problem that yes, it does form a group, okay? And this is kind of a key point that I didn't really talk about. The, in the Minkowski space, it's a four dimensional space where you're rotating around a single coordinate point, a single point, there's a single point of origin. But that's not, but essentially relative motion of inertial frames is a translation no two points are the same in a translation. So you look at that and you go, excuse me, this looks like muddled mathematics and muddled definitions. So it's I, it, what, what they're doing is basically just, the mathematics is just very confused. And so yeah, <laughs> there are ways around uh, the fact that the mathematics is muddled up. You know, the, the basic invariance to uh, point in space, uh, velocity of changing distance between points in space, uh, velocity of uh, you're talking about Minkowski's theory space. now. Yep, you go. We were talking look, about Minkowski's theory. You know, we're talking about you Einstein's. Forget about 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 relativ relativ <laughs> relativizing. You know, relativizing everything. How they? I don't know. I cannot get there. Well, that's one of the tricks that they pull. Is they say, point. well, let's talk about Minkowski. We already discussed that. I already talked about how Bourne did that um, in response to what Dingle was saying and uh, just published this diagram and said, because this diagram proves uh, relativity is correct, therefore Dingle is wrong. And that wasn't really much of an argument. But that's typical of the way the... Uh, Elite argues, though. They'll, they'll right, well, well, I mean, let's face it, the bottom line is if you're a physicist and all the textbooks tell you what the equations are, for somebody to come along and say, oops, you guys better ought to be rethinking your theory because it doesn't really, you know, make a lot of sense. And here are some examples of, uh, of uh, why it doesn't really make a lot of sense. You know, they're basically you know, going to pull a Fauci on you and say, I am the science. Exactly. <laughs> okay, anybody else with comments or questions? Okay, I guess I get can go to my bottom line, uh, which was my thesis here. Um, uh, I claim both the... 1905 and 1907 versions of relativity require clocks to run at the same universal rate. So, um, and now we now we have the you know clock can't all the clocks according to the principle of relativity all have to run at the same rate. You can't have clocks running at different rates and um, different inertial frames. Um, and then. Um, but we have these experiments, you know, the GPS, the muon, the hateful Keating experiments that show that clocks, you know, uh, if they're interpreted as clocks, that they run at different rates. So this falsifies the principle of relativity. We really shouldn't be accepting the principle of relativity. Um, and so um, Einstein's erroneous predictions uh, are, are apparently validated. Now, this is where the problem runs into in that uh, he made these erroneous predictions uh, by saying that, um, you know, a clock at the equator will run slower than a clock at the pole. And he gave these examples in his 1905 paper and he repeated it, them again in his 1907, one of them again in his 1912 paper. And then he made the statement about, um, you know, a, um, a space traveler would age more slowly. Um, those don't really, they're not really correct predictions if you accept the principle of relativity as correct. 
So I think the confusion that arises here is that people look at his incorrect predictions that he made in 1905 and um, say, well, Einstein's theory is correct because he predicted these things, but he didn't predict them correctly. They are not correct predictions. And so his theory is not validated by the experiments as they claim. So that's my thesis. Um, in addition to the fact that I, I basically claim what the mathematics is incorrect. Very good. Um, I've looked at this issue for about 50 years and you have uh, added some good insights for me. Thank you. All right, Nick. Okay, anybody else? I, we got about two minutes and 30 Here, Harry, um, David Bauer speaking here. Uh, I don't understand why you say the 1905 and 1907 versions require clocks to run at the same universal rate. Are you saying that a clock in motion, that Einstein was saying that a clock in motion will have the same rate as a clock at rest? It can't. None of this theory, none, uh, the point is that in 1905 people, he made these statements as examples of the theory of relativity and people took them as predictions and he said that um, a clock in motion will lose time or have its time retarded, okay, because of its motion, okay? That's not correct, okay? That's an incorrect prediction. Uh, none, of, none of the 1905, none of the versions of relativity can predict that a clock runs slow unless they are incorrect in their prediction. Does that make sense to you, what I'm saying? Let, uh, let me say it in another way, that Einstein based everything in that 1905 and 1907 paper on the special relativity principle. And then he made errors that led to predictions that were inconsistent with his basic assumptions. And unfortunately... <laughs> And even those predictions weren't right, but they were, they were. Right, and the, and the problem is that um, in the, uh, and I.J. Good gets into this with, um, I can't remember the guy, the Canadian guys, Ian. Ian uh, McCausland. Yeah, okay, and kind of McCausland takes up Dingle's argument. Um, and continues on with good. I didn't really talk about that because that's sort of outside the scope. And um, you know, kind of at some point, good kind of admits that Einstein made a slip and that he really shouldn't have said what he said in his 1905 paper. But that's as far as good would go. I mean, he'd kind of got beaten to the point Thanks, Harry, and thanks to everyone for joining in.